Hi, this is Joshua with Seth, and I want to take a few minutes today and talk to you about my experience as the voice actor of the leading role of Tetsuo in the anime classic Akira. And I'm bringing this up because Akira was just released on Blu-ray DVD. I noticed it's selling really well. It's number one in its category on Amazon. I've been getting a lot of hits on it on the web recently. And I don't usually talk about my days in voiceover because I've retired from voiceover. But I figured to mark the occasion, why not? I'll talk a little bit about that time in my life. Wayback machine. Going back in time. Back when I was a film student at NYU, I wandered into an art house cinema. This would have been maybe, probably 1991, would be my guess. And they were playing Akira. Now, at that time, anime wasn't really popular in the United States. I'd never heard the term anime and I'd never seen a cartoon that was made for adults. But I was doing a lot of voice work at NYU's film school. I ended up going out to, when I graduated, I went out to Hollywood and I started doing voiceovers. But the real turning point in my acting career was when I went to see Akira, because I didn't know what I was going in for. It just looked really interesting. The poster was interesting, and this concept of animated feature film for adults was new to me and in the marketplace at the time. So I went in and I came out totally changed. I was like blown away. This is the future of animation as far as I was concerned at that time. This is before Pixar and the stuff that is commonplace today, before Pokemon and Digimon and all that, remember. I saw this as like the future of animation and then uh, indeed a few years later it really caught on. So anyway, I moved out to Los Angeles. I started getting voiceover work pretty quickly. Like within um, a week I had a voice agent in Hollywood, which is kind of unheard of. And then very quickly after that I got hired to do a lot of radio commercials and voiceovers on TV commercials. I did a lot of voices for Disneyland. Mom, Dad, can we go to Disneyland? You know, that, it's a magic kingdom, that kind of thing. And doing sort of a young version of my voice. Well, soon after that I began to get anime roles, primarily through a company called Saban that did Power Rangers. Did Power Rangers, did did uh, Digimon was the one that really kicked. I mean, I did a lot of little things, little things, little things, and then Digimon. Uh, I played Ty, the leader of the Digimon, uh, on Fox Kids every Monday through Friday and Saturday mornings. And then I started doing the promos. I really got locked in for about six years after doing Digimon. It was nonstop work, a couple of sessions a day sometimes, every day of the week. And I attained a certain level of success in the field of voice acting in America for anime, I was pretty much at the top at that point. I really couldn't have worked anymore even if I'd wanted to. But the thing that made it successful for me was not the amount of the work, it was the quality of the work. I always wanted to do good work. And the, work, the, the projects that I was involved with were of varying degrees of quality, let's say. So one day I get a call from Kevin Seymour who directed the American version of Akira, the, rather the, um, the pioneer dub version of Akira. There was a streamlined dub before this one, a version I'd originally seen. And he called me, and he worked with me on other projects. He said, Joshua, do you want to come in and voice Tetsuo and Akira? And I was like, do I want to? That's, that's what got me into this business. I, I would love to, but it was done years ago. And he explained that they were dumping all this money into remastering the print and making the, the audio track, uh, the, the music and the effects better, the M&E track, and they're going to revoice it, and I didn't have to audition if, if I wanted the part of Tetsuo, it was mine. So, for me, for the first time as a voice actor, even with Digimon, even with all the other 50, 60 projects that I had done at that point, for the first time I really felt success successful and proud of my work and, and happy to be a part of that anime industry. And I, there was other work that I did that I enjoyed. I certainly enjoyed doing time on Digimon. I thought I did good work as Dio, Dio Etika in, um, in Last Exile or Hige in Wolf's Rain or as the announcer voice for the Batman series or, you know, any of these other... I did other good work. I'm not saying that I, I didn't enjoy the other work, but I always felt really proud of the work that I did in Akira. And I know it's gotten mixed reviews. Some people prefer the original dub, some people prefer Pioneer, some people prefer watching it with, uh, with the subtitles. Hey, that's all good, you know, but I was happy to be involved in it. I felt like I and everybody else that were involved in that Pioneer dub brought a, a feeling of gravitas to it. Like we, we were, we were, um, we took it seriously. We were proud to be involved with it. We didn't just 
go in there and, and knock the thing out as quickly as possible. We, we really took our time with it. Kevin was a great director. The other people that voiced it with me were really into their parts as well. And we gave it all we got, I guess is what I'm saying. And even to this day, uh, it's one of only two posters from all the anime that I ever recorded that I have down in my, in my uh, one of my home theaters is a Wii home theater. It's all set up for Wii and Guitar Hero and Rock Band and stuff. And the only two anime posters I got up are of the Digimon movie and the Akira movie. So if you are among the people that are fans of the version of Akira that we voiced, thank you. Thank you for the support. Thank you for all the emails. To this day, I still get one or two emails a day for the anim anime work. And if I don't respond to it, my apologies. I just get inundated with it, and it's not where my focus is. I'll end this by saying why I retired from anime and from voice acting in general. I, Like I said, I got to the point where... I was spending all day driving around to studios to audition, in between auditions, doing a two to four hour voice voice gig on something. And then when I got back home, there was more stuff to audition for. And just because of time constraints, I'd have to record it in my home studio and email it in. It was all consuming. It consumed my life for about six years. It took a, you know, a half a dozen years to get to the point where the work was plentiful. And then you struggle as an actor to get to the point where you have work coming toward you instead of you going toward the work, you don't want to give any of it away. So I worked and I worked and I worked, and I just burned out. I just got to the point where I didn't want to stand in a little padded room, devoid of audience feedback, with a headphone on, and a mic in front of me, and a monitor, and looking at the page with a little light on top, hardly able to see, and some director on the other side of the glass there, you know, telling me, beep, 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 take, and then do the take. It, it, it got to the point where one of the last, one of the last, anime projects I ever voiced was Wolf's Reign. And I thought that came out really well. And again, we had another great director, and you don't sell those directors short. They, they, they uh, are an integral part of the process of getting the performances that you enjoy out of those voice actors. So Mary Elizabeth was the director on that one. I remember her telling me she was very good at communicating the tone of the piece to me, and she'd say, this is the tone. I'd be like, okay, and I'd literally be bouncing off the walls, off of the padded cell that I felt that I was in. I remember calling that recording studio the submarine because it was padded even on the ceiling. And I'd be throwing myself off the wall just trying to keep myself awake and engaged until that third beep and then I'd snap to attention and deliver the line. And then I'd be bouncing off the walls again. I was just ready to go. And since then, I have been touring the world as a hypnotist, doing my stage show, doing my seminars, doing, you know, stuff in front of live audiences nonstop, 300 days a year, ever since I left. I left uh, Hollywood. I uh, sold my house in 05 moved up to the beach in Santa Barbara for a while, decompressed on the beach, and then hit the road and started touring, and I've never looked back. So it's not that I didn't enjoy being a voice actor in Hollywood or uh, appreciate the people I was involved with or the work that we put out. It was just I, as a human being and an artist, needed audience feedback, live theater, and the experience of touring while I was still young enough to do it. So that's it. So from my first initial experience with Akira as a as a film student in NYU, to, to struggling as a voice actor in Hollywood, to making it as a voice actor in Hollywood, to getting my dream job of voicing the actual project that got me into uh, voiceovers in the first place. That's pretty much my journey as it relates to Akira. That took a little longer than I intended, but I hope that was interesting to you. I know I get a lot of um, people asking me about that stuff, and I, I generally don't have a chance to respond to it. So, so there's the answer for everybody that wondered uh, what my favorite roles were, how I got involved in this, and, uh, and why I left. Uh, those, those are the answers right there. Feel free to comment on the YouTube page here or on my website, joshuaseth.com. Uh, this page will be up on joshuaseth.com slash Akira if you want to go there and see any additional text and comments I might have made uh, about this issue. But let's just do it on that page, joshuaseth.com slash Akira. All right, thanks for watching, and thanks for listening.